Uh, all right, everybody, uh, welcome to the October 9th uh, monthly meeting uh, for the Central Arkansas Astronomical Society. And uh, my name is Chris. I'll be hosting tonight. Uh, do we have any new members that are here? That would like to speak up and introduce themselves. I noticed David's here. He was there at the observatory last night. He's relatively new. He, it looks like he's connecting still right now. Uh, okay. Tony Brantley. Yeah, this is Tony. I'm brand new, pretty much. <laughs> well, welcome, absolutely, Tony. Absolutely brand new. And David Bell is relatively new. He's brand new here. Welcome, David. Would you like to introduce yourself and say anything? You or Tony, either one? I don't really have anything, now. How'd okay. you find us, Tony? Um, I just did a, actually did a Google search online just to try to find a group to join. And what piqued and your interest? I just love, I've always loved stargazing and um, I've done it since I was a kid, but just decided to take it up a notch and try to find some, a group of people that love the same thing that I love and learn from people. Sounds fun to me. You were going yeah. to come up last night we, and you got a guess on you. I did. I was so upset. I was like, you are crushing me here. I've got to go look at my stuff. But anyway, but I'll definitely be up there. It was a pretty night last night. We wish you could have come on up. A lot of people were sharing a lot of equipment and oh, a lot of knowledge. So and there's a Pam. I don't know Pam. Pam must be new. That's no that's Pam. actually Ken, I think. Oh, is that Ken? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, I'm on cell phone tonight, so I'm, I'm not sure how to work this thing. That's why I'm not saying a whole lot. Well, Ken, we're glad you're here tonight, sir. Thank you. <laughs> and David Bell was up last night. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. David, can you hear us? He stepped away, I guess. All right, and I apologize. Is Sandra Morris? Yes, uh, Sandy and Pat Morris. Yeah. Yeah, they're new members. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, welcome, welcome, folks. They've only been in the club about 40 years. Okay, yeah. I apologize. <laughs> Wait, I apologize. Well, it's been so long since we've seen them, they might as well be new members. That's yeah. yeah. We agree. We agree. It's been a long time. <laughs> Love you guys. Thank you. We call on Pat anytime we got to drive a nail. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All righty. Uh, anybody else would like to introduce themselves? All right. Well, then we will move along. Uh, we have our first presenter tonight, if I'm correct, is Carl. That'd be great. Um, uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Okay, good. I don't have a video, but uh, I'm going to let uh, Bruce, or I'm uh, sorry, Michael, share, share my slides and I'll, uh, I'll just kind of talk through them. Um, I'm, uh, I've been in the club, I guess, a little bit over a year. Uh, I guess I'd call myself a beginner or intermediate astronomer. Got about a thousand observations so far. And so I'm just going to share you some ideas I have about eyepieces and uh, don't, don't claim to be an expert, but uh, just hoping to give you some of the things I've learned as I bought and sold eyepieces and some of the mistakes I've made. So hopefully y'all won't make the same mistakes I did. Oh, I see it then. All right. Is, is it showing up? I uh, don't see it yet, Michael. I said to hit, hit share. Okay. 
Is it showing now? There it yes, is. Sir. All right. Just let me know when you want me to advance the screen. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to just kind of give you an introduction to how many varieties of eyepieces you have. Hang on um, a second. Are... Why is it not advancing? OK, there you go. So this slide is just trying to show you some of the uh, array of choices you have for eyepieces. Um, the cheapest eyepieces start only at you know, 30 or 40 bucks. Um, and then the one and a quarter inch eyepieces go up to you know, a few hundred dollars. And the most expensive eyepiece I could find online was a three inch, 100 degree field of view, explore scientific eyepiece for over $1,000. So uh, the prices and the sizes all vary quite a bit. Uh, next slide, please, Mike. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't think that's yeah. enough choices, they also have choices like uh, Zoom eyepieces, uh, eyepiece kits, and reticle eyepieces. So the, the number of options you have is just really pretty staggering. Uh, next slide, please. So if I was to, uh, when I'm looking to buy an eyepiece, uh, I always ask myself a couple of questions. And uh, the first is, you know, what are, what are you using? Which telescope are you pairing your eyepiece with? What eyepieces do you currently have? Perhaps most importantly, what are you trying to observe? And what's your budget? And then overall, will the eyepiece work with the rest of your imaging chain, be that your mount or your tripod or your, or your telescope itself? Um, what equipment are you trying to pair it with? Uh, next slide, please. Oops, hang on a second. No, that's fine. Um, so unfortunately, this is kind of basic telescope math, and uh, and you just kind of have to understand some of these ideas. And so this will be a little bit dry, but just trying to explain to everyone what are what are these parameters and and which one depends on the telescope, and which one depends on the IP. Some depend on one, some depend on other. The other ones depend on most. I don't like that one of those was, but that just was disgusting. Okay, somebody's uh in the background there. You might want to mute. Mute. Yeah. You go, could you go to the next slide, please, Michael? So this is that's the summary, and we'll go through each one individually. So we go to the next slide again. So the, uh, each telescope has a minimum and maximum magnification that's a useful uh, magnification for the telescope. It's roughly 50 uh, power per inch. So for my 10 inch daub, roughly 500 power is max power. And the minimum power is roughly four times the aperture in inches. So roughly for, for again, for that daub would be about four, 40 times, uh, that'd be the minimum power. So that depends on uh, only the telescope itself. Uh, next slide, please. The magnification that you get with any given eyepiece depends on both the telescope itself and the eyepiece. And just a reminder, uh, a long focal length like 25 millimeters is actually low power, where a short focal length like five millimeters is high power. And so what you do is you just divide the focal length of the telescope, which is always stamped on the tube by the focal length of the eyepiece. And you come up with whatever power it happens to be. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, field of view tells you how much you can see through a given eyepiece. There's actually two sorts of field of view. There's the apparent field of view, and that's based on the eyepiece itself. So the way a lot of people explain that to you is if you look out at the horizon and hold the eyepiece up to your eye, how high up the sky can you see um, through the eyepiece? So for a cheap eyepiece, it may be 30 or 40 degrees. For an expensive eyepiece, that may be 100 degrees, meaning if you look toward the horizon, you'd actually see all the way up to the zenith and beyond. Uh, so that's the apparent field of view. And then you also got to pair that with a telescope itself. So the way you calculate it, the true field of view is the apparent field of view divided by the magnification. So it changes based on the uh, telescope as well. Uh, next slide. And, and please, if, this is not a formal talk at all. So anyone, if it has any questions, just stop me and we, 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 can, we can take a little detour if we need to. Um, uh, exit pupil means how big is the image at the size at, at your eye. Um, usually that's in the range of a few millimeters, you know, one millimeter to about six or so millimeters. And that depends both on the telescope and the eyepiece. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, eye relief is how far away the image is from the eyepiece. So basically, do you have to put your eye on the eyepiece or can you keep it a distance, distance away? 
Uh, some people say that only people with glasses need to worry about that. At least in my experience, that's not been true. I don't like getting eyeball boogers on the eyepiece. I like to have a little space. So um, a little space is a nice thing. So 15 millimeters is a nice, nice rule of thumb. Uh, next slide. Um, we won't delve too deep into this, but limiting magnitude is generally dependent on the telescope only. Um, and so for a telescope like my 10 inch dial, the limiting magnitude is about 14 and a half, and at least in theory. Uh, that's a very optimistic number based on really good uh, uh, seeing conditions, you know, really dark sky, those sort of things. Um, as just as a short aside, remember that the higher the number, actually the fainter the object. So Polaris is a plus two all Sirius is a minus 1.5. So Polaris is much, much fainter than Sirius. Um, so just keep that in mind. And the other thing is, at least when I first started, I would see these um, magnitudes for things like a, a nebula. It would be like a mag six, like a real bright nebula. And I'd say, oh, great, I can really see that with my small reflector. Well, well, nebulas and other diffuse sources of light, like globular clusters or comets, at least as a rule of thumb, you probably should track, subtract about three mags. So if my telescope my dog has a theoretical max of 14 and a half, probably more realistically it was 13 to 13 and a half. So for a globular it's probably closer to about 11. So it's, um, you know, just, just keep that in mind. The few sources of light aren't like stars. All right. Uh, yes, Carl, sir. This is Bruce. What that, when they, uh, it would be useful to tell, tell everybody that what that really amounts to is if you took that diffuse object and it's, it's light, and con concentrated it into a star, that's what that means. So uh, it depends on how big the object is. Uh, your rule of thumb is a good one, I'm sure, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's condensing that into a, a point of light and the magnitude it would have if it were a star. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. Yeah, you know, at the North American Nebula, which is at the zenith now in, in the evenings, you know, it's a relatively bright nebula, but but it's a spread over a large area. And, and, and like Bruce is saying, you know, if you can listen to a point, it'd be pretty bright, but it's not, it's spread out. And that makes it really much harder to see. Uh, next slide, please. And lastly, resolution. That, that says uh, how far apart can two points be where you can still just uh, ascertain their points and not a blob. And so that, uh, I think, and that depends only on the telescope. So could we go to the next slide, Michael? So this is uh, trying to explain that in a little more fun way. Uh, so if you had, I actually own three telescopes here. So if you look at the top, it's a, it's a Lunt solar telescope. It's about uh, 80 millimeters. And then the 10 inch daub is there, the big black one. And then on top of the daub is actually a, a 250 millimeter finer scope. So it's a little bit of a stretch, but that's my third telescope. Um, so if you uh, put a 25 millimeter eyepiece in each of these um, telescopes, what would you see? Well, on the right is an image trying to show, it's a simulated image of what you'd see if you look through it. You can see that the little white circle is the finer scope. It would have the lowest magnification, only be at 10x. It would have a huge field of view about six degrees. Then it would have the lowest resolution about two arc seconds. The orange circle is what you'd have with if you use the daub with the same uh, eyepiece. And on that uh, instance, you'd get a much smaller field of view about one, de one degree you get a pr relatively higher magnification, about 50X, and the resolution would be about half an arc second. So that if you use the same eyepiece for several different uh, telescopes, you get different results. Uh, next slide, please. This is kind of the flip side of that. If you used one, te one uh, telescope, you used three eyepieces, what would you get? Um, these three eyepieces are just ones I pulled off the internet. I, I, I own one or two, but I don't own them all. Um, the Teleview eyepiece is a, is a wide field of view eyepiece. And you can see it would give you a low power at 25x and a pretty good field of view. This is the wild duck cluster here in the center. And then if you use the orange Excel, uh, uh, Celestron Excel eyepiece, you get kind of a mid power there, about 62x and a medium sized field of view. And then if you use that batter Morpheus, you get a higher power uh, at, at almost 90. And the field of view is kind of funny, even though you, you're increasing the power from can, as compared to the Excel. The field of view is almost the same, and that's because the uh, apparent field of view of the Morpheus is higher than the Excel. So although you're magging up, the eyepiece has a wider field of view to start with, so it's more or less a wash. Does anyone have any questions? I might go back about two slides. 
of log five or five log back one more. That, so yeah, that, down there. Never heard of five log. What? Where did that name come from? <laughs> So I found I found a couple of different um, things online as far as formulas, how people are computing um, limiting magnitude for a telescope. Uh, Jim Dixon also said that was one he hadn't heard of. It was one I found online. Um, I'm not sure if it's valid or not. Um, there were other more complicated formulas online that actually took into play your type of telescope, the the um, the, the exquisiteness or the uh, of the optics or lack thereof. And that, those sort of things, and it was a more complicated formula. But um, you know, they do usually stamp it on the tube what they say the limiting mag is. But I'm I'm not sure. I, I don't remember to be honest where I got that formula from. Somewhere online. The uh, can y'all hear me? Yes. 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 Yeah. The the uh, the the log five is. Uh, it's the, and I'm doing this from distant memory, but it's like it takes five magnitudes to make a uh, hundred times difference or something like that. It's a, it's the, it's a, it's a logarithmic scale, but it's, it's a base that's real strange. So uh, like for instance, the first mag, from first magnitude to second magnitude is like two and a half or 2.8 times or something like that. And then it, it just works like that because your eye is, is not linear. It, it's sensitive, more like a logarithmic scale where something twice as bright doesn't really look twice as bright to your eye, if that makes sense. Yeah, I've heard that. I, I think he was driving at where that formula come from as far as knowing the limiting magnitude of a telescope. And again, I, that's the part I don't remember. But yeah, on, on magnitude of a star, yeah, it is 2.5 or 8 or whatever that is. Well, the, the to, to calculate the theoretical on a telescope, you just take your aperture eye, which is, say, a third of an inch when it's fully dilated. And uh, then your aperture of your telescope, which is say 10 inches, which is gonna be 30 times the diameter, but you square that, you get 900. And then you just take that, the logarithm of that to, to figure out how many magnitudes you can add to what you can see visually. Um, it's not really something you need to know <laughs> to, to know how to use magnitudes, but, but that's the math anyway. So we go forward uh, two slides, please, Michael. <clears throat> uh, one more. And one more. <clears throat> so um, th these are my general thoughts for, for if you were a beginner starting off. Um, most of the time you're going to be, be using low power. And so that if you were going to buy an upgrade IPC, that would be the one I'd recommend to buy first. Um, the, the exception to that is if you really like things like the moon or the planets, then you're going to want a high power eyepiece. But for most people, low power is going to be used most of the time. Um, I match the quality of your eyepiece with your mount. Uh, again, you know, there's no reason to have a um, uh, economical telescope and a premium eyepiece. You have to have kind of things that go together. Um, and exit people is a really important idea. I didn't understand when I first started. Um, somewhere around uh, three to five millimeters is pretty good for, for most standard work. And somewhere around one millimeter is pretty good for planetary work. If you get above five or six millimeters, it starts to be larger than your eye can dilate, unless you're very young and very dark skies. And that can be a little bit of a problem. Um, I've bought a lot of my gear used, and that's, that seems to have worked out pretty well. It's usually at a, at a discounted price. And most of the time, I've got, the gear I've gotten online has been pretty well taken care of. And if you don't like it, you can always sell it back at almost the same price you bought it at. So that's a, that's a nice thing. And then um, I guess if we can go to the next slide, um, the last thing I'd say is that I think there's a lot of diminishing returns on this. I like it. there isn't a lot of things, you know, guitars or whatever else you, 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 your hobbies are. Um, at some point at the beginning of the, of the curve, you kind of get what you pay for. And then the curve goes up really steeply and somewhere around 100 to $200, you get a whole lot of eyepiece. And then after that point, you start to get to where there's decreased returns. It's better, but not nearly as much as you're putting into it. 
and the curves, uh, you know, leveling off. Uh, next slide, please. And so I, and I always su suggest you use a field of view simulator. This is the one I use. So this is like uh, before I started using um, solar astronomy, just to kind of get an idea of what, what the object is going to look like uh, before you before you actually buy an eyepiece. And that's uh, yeah, the astronomy tool. Yeah, you got it down at the bottom. That's a very good one, by the way. Yeah, so that's, uh, you know, you can you can play with all the different numbers and you can play with eyepieces that are too expensive for your budget or whatever. Things are realistic, but and you can also, those other sl earlier slides show several eyepieces at once. You get a comparison of what it would look like in various telescopes or various eyepieces in the same telescopes or whatever. So it's, it's pretty useful. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. So again, this is just, and that's kind of all the background and I'm sorry, it's kind of a long talk, but this is, this is the discussion of the eyepieces I've had over the years um and things that I, I i learned from uh the first eyepiece i had were uh modified acromats which is kind of a, a a base sort of eyepiece the closest comparison i found was on this uh picture here this plossel um the problem with my first telescope my first eyepieces was the eye relief was very low um basically again you had to put your eye against the eye, uh eyepiece to see uh the field of view was very small and on top of that the, the mount was a little bit wobbly and I had a hard time using high power. So if we can go to the next slide, uh, what I really wanted to see when I started was the rings of Saturn. Um, so I couldn't see it with the stuff I had. I, I knew I really needed a higher, higher power to see Saturn, but um, I also knew if I got too high a power, the, um, the, the mount couldn't handle it. So I got this nine millimeter Excel eyepiece and it was only 50 X, but I thought you know, I, I was good enough to see the rings of Saturn. You can see the simulated image down below Saturn's there and you can see the rings, but it is a speck. So um, <laughs> anyways, but I was able to do what I was trying to do with it. Um, and it was a well-reviewed eyepiece. People thought highly of it online, so that's why I bought it. Um, so it was a big upgrade for me. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, and then shortly thereafter, uh, I've kind of started accumulating some more gear. I ended up buying that daub there on the, on the bottom. And then I bought the Excel eyepieces in 5 and 25 millimeters. And that really, at that point, gave me a huge range of magnifications, somewhere between 50 and five, uh, 250x, which is you know low, medium, and high magnifications. Uh, and those eyepieces really did a whole lot for me. They had good eye relief. The quality of the images were, were good. Um, they had great range of magnification. And and the since they were one and one quarter size, they were cheaper than two-inch eyepieces, and the accessories for them were cheaper than the, the two-inch accessories. Um, and some of those I bought used. So it was a really good set for me and I use them quite a bit. If I only had three eyepieces and those were the three I had, you could do quite a bit with those three eyepieces. Uh, next slide, please. And then I decided to um, uh, buy a Zoom eyepiece. I had never had one before, but someone, a lot of people have said the Batter Zoom was a really nice eyepiece online. So I ended up buying the Batter Zoom. I bought it used for about uh, 60% of the purchase or the new price. It's a very versatile eyepiece, kind of like a Swiss Army knife. It does a little bit of everything. It's got a bunch of different adapters in the in the kit. And if you buy, they also have a Barlow that comes with them. We'll talk about that at the very end, what a Barlow is. If you bought the Barlow, the range of, 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 of focal lengths goes from about four millimeters to 24 millimeters, which is just about every useful magnification there is. Uh, so very versatile eyepiece. Um, the stars were are pretty good through the uh, through the um, through the batter. The eye, re eye relief is good. Um, the the thing the zoom has just really taught me a lot. When I was first using, it, I was using it to hunt asteroids, and I realized as I zoomed in through the batter at 24 millimeters to let's say 12 millimeters, I could see quite a bit fainter stars and asteroids. It would it would gain one or even two mags of 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 visibility and i did it under, and that's because of the um the exit people I, and that's kind of why i started to understand exit people so it's been a really useful eyepiece and i've used it all the time and i still have it um uh next slide please but if you don't like that particular zoom you've got all these other choices for zoom eyepieces uh the cheapest ones are about under a hundred dollars and then the more expensive ones are, are batters on the more expensive side uh, and then they also even have things like this little Teleview uh, planetary eyepiece. So they, they can do anything you want to do. And they're, like I said, if you just go outside with one eyepiece and one small telescope, it's a nice one to take outside. Uh, next slide, please. 
And then I decided I really liked open clusters. So I thought I wanted the ultimate large field of view eyepiece. Uh, so I, I wanted to minimize my magnification. And then I didn't want to spend, spend a whole lot of money for the huge field of view eyepieces because the field of view, as the field of view goes up, the uh, price goes up exponentially. So I, I got this Explore Scientific 32 millimeter eyepiece. Um, the only problem with the eyepiece was I forgot about the exit people. Again, I didn't understand that at the time. And since the exit people are so large, um, it's, it's hard, it was hard for my eyes to get in all the uh, light because some of the light is at six and a half millimeters, that's wider than my pupil. And so some of that light is spilled around the pupil and the iris. And so you can't see it. You lose a little bit of the, um, of the fainter object with that, which is not a big deal a lot of times. But anyways, that was the, the, the biggest drawback to that eyepiece. If you can go to the next slide, please, Michael. Um, so, but again, that was a, a pretty good eye, eyepiece for me. I liked it a lot. The stars were great. Um, it was a little bit heavy. And this started to get into some of my problems. I realized over time that I had to move the altitude bearings on my daub to keep it from falling over. Um, just because it, it pulled the daub down. Uh, so that was, I, I didn't realize that was a problem until I, until I started messing with it. So next slide. You didn't try using a counterweight? Well, that came later. Um, so then I decided I wanted a, I wanted a black eyepiece with green letters. Uh, so I got the, a Teleview Type 4. Um, I was trying to fix the uh, exit people, which I did. I got to about four and a half millimeters, which is pretty ideal for dark uh, DSOs. And it had a pretty big field of view, you know, 82 degrees field of view. So it's more or less the same as the Explore Scientific, but it's a pound and a half. It, it is literally a pound and a half. It is a huge uh, weight on the front of the, the uh, telescope. And it, it, no matter what I did at that point, I couldn't use the daub with just as it was. So I had to get a counterweight and I uh, got a magnet counterweight to kind of move around. And as the, as the daub goes up and down, the counterweight has to go back and forth or it won't stay balanced. So it's, um, I guess, part of the main thrust of this talk is everything has a, has a trade-off. Some things have better than others, but nothing's, there's no such thing as a perfect eyepiece. Uh, next slide, please. So that's what I currently have uh, there for eyepieces. Um, the uh, televues in the back and then the batters in the back right and then the excels. And then the front was a little bit of a reticle eyepiece I bought used online uh, to track planets with my um, finder scope. Uh, next slide. I wanna say a word about a Barlow. A Barlow is a lens that increases the focal length of a telescope. So the most standard is a 2X. And you can think about, about that basically as doubling the magnification of your eyepiece. So if you have a 20 millimeter eyepiece, you put a 2X bar low, all of a sudden you have a 10X or 10 millimeter eyepiece uh, equivalent. So it can, it can give you more versatility. Um, again, the standard is a 2X, but they, they go all the way up to 5X if you can, you can find some that are unusual powers. Um, all the eyepieces do have built-in bar lows. You may, you may not be aware of that, but like the Excels have built-in bar lows. Um, if you're going to buy a Barlow, the, the biggest word of advice is to make sure you plan carefully. Um, if you look at the first example here, if you have a 25, 12, and 5 millimeter eyepiece, you put a Barlow on it, you really haven't gained any useful powers. They're all pretty much the same except for the 2.5 millimeter. But if you did something more, a, a little more clever, like the 25, 15, and 5 millimeter eyepieces, all of a sudden, each time you Barlow it to a 2X, you would have a useful power. So you get six, basically six useful powers versus three. Um, I, I, I've heard, I don't own a Barlow, full, full disclosure. Uh, I have heard if you, you don't want to cheap out on a Barlow, it, it, the cheap Barlows are a problem. Uh, and the last thing I'd say is that I, I've called Teleview a couple of times to ask them for some advice. And I asked Al Nagler last time I talked to him, I'm like, well, what do you think about a bar Barlow or PowerMate? He said, don't. So <laughs> the guy who sells them says, don't buy them. So I, I don't know. Again, I don't have any experience with them, but I just, uh, I thought that was interesting. That's what he told me. Um, next slide, please. Um, so eyepiece care, I, I just threw this in at the last minute, um, but, but Andrew actually told me this trick. If you get one of these little bulbs, if you either get a rubber bulb from a drugstore, this one's on Amazon, you can take it and blow off all the dust off your equipment without having to actually scrape, a, scrape off the top of the lens, which is a good thing. And then you also turn me on this Nikon lens uh, pen which has a real soft brush on one end and a cleaner on the other. Again, to clean it up if you really have a, a big mess. Um, and the last thing, you can see this eyepiece on the bottom. 
this is a used eyepiece I bought online and did it, you know, I guess it got what I paid for. Um, it has eyepiece mold on it. I don't know if you can see those spots on it. That's actually mold or fungus. Um, and so that is a thing. And uh, so when I first started, I think it was Michael who told me, you know, make sure you when you take your stuff out at the end of the night, and you bring it to the house, make sure you let it air out for a day or two. And that's what I've always done. I've always let it. Well, it doesn't have to be a day or two. It can just be for an hour. But you just well, want the you know, moisture to evaporate off, yeah. Yeah. Well, usually I'm coming in, my wife's sleeping, and I just kind of throw it in, throw it in the uh, on the bookshelf somewhere, let it air out. But but don't put it away wet, or you really you really will get eyepiece molds. I was I'd never seen them before, but um, I, it's a thing. So, um, and last slide, please. So I guess in summary, there, there are uh, many many choices for eyepieces, and there's no single perfect eyepiece anymore. There's a perfect telescope. Um, so the biggest questions are, what are you trying to look at and how much are you going to spend? Are you willing to compromise with a Zoom eyepiece that does everything a little bit uh, okay? Or would you rather have a uh, fixed focal eyepiece that does it one thing well? And then match the quality of your eyepiece and, your, and the rest of your imaging chain. And then just realize that if, you, if you get heavier eyepieces, uh, you know, you have problems with your mount. And uh, consider a low power eyepiece as your first upgrade. And I would also say that a couple of good eyepieces, two or three, or maybe even four, is a lot better than 10 cheaper eyepieces because you're only going to use one or two in any given night. You're probably not going to use five eyepieces. Um, and so make sure you use your simulator before you buy one so you kind of plan out and make a good choice. And then it's it's really nice to be able to borrow one of these or, or buy a used one, again, to, to try it before you buy it or try it at a cheap price. Um, anyway, that's kind of what I had. I'm happy to answer your questions, and uh, hopefully that was helpful for you all. Hey, great talk, man. That uh, that's that's a great talk. Comprehensive. Uh, the the uh, I had one comment that you didn't touch on that you almost did, but uh, when using Barlow's, uh, if you have an eyepiece with a real wide apparent field, um, the Barlow will increase your magnification, but it doesn't change your apparent field and and uh, and really your eye relief. So if you have an eyepiece that you like uh, and is comfortable, you can use a Barlow with it and you, it's still about the same comfort level for you. Uh, you're just in the same apparent field, you just have more magnification. Um, so that's one of the things that people like about Barlow's, but you're right, you don't wanna buy a cheap one there. It just, it doesn't pay. Um, Let's see, I had one other comment. What was I thinking? Um, the, uh, uh, oh, I was going to say on the, the, you're exactly right on the televiews and some of the more advanced eyepieces, that's basically a Barlow's built into the design. And uh, so when you're using uh, one of those uh, super wide field eyepieces, he has to put so many different types of glass in there to, to take out all the errors. It, it does get very heavy, and um, that's just because it's it's such a wide field of view. Another thing, if you're like using a, a if you're using a Barlow and you're already using a field flattener, take the field flattener out. The Barlow will flatten the field. Otherwise, you just end up with extra weight that you don't need. You know, coma corrector. You know, don't use it. Take it out and. Uh, the Barlow will act as a coma corrector. Yeah, I was just shocked that when I first got the Explore Scientific, I was like, man, this is a heavy eyepiece. And then when I got the Televiewer, I was like, oh my gosh, it's just like a cannonball at the end of the end of the daub. It, just, <laughs> it, it really is impressive in, in a bad way, sort of. <laughs> well, see, the nice thing about oh. an equatorial mount is you can slide the, the telescope up and forward or backward and kind of counterbalance. It's and or use the counterweights, so it's it, the Opsonian's a little tougher to deal with that. Yeah, I mean, but if you change eyepieces, whether you're in an equatorial or a dog, if you have everything balanced and you change that bout to a no, more normal weight, it just it makes everything wacky again. Mm -hmm. But again, that's part that's part of the pluses and minuses of any using any eyepiece. You know, like I said, there's no Correct. there's no perfect eyepiece. Oh, one one more little tricky thing that I've learned over the years, you know. A lot of the reason you want eye relief is so you can keep your glasses on. And and by the way, if you have Verilux or any of those 
or bifocals, those are not very good to use with a telescope. Uh, just a plain one prescription uh, eyeglass is the best. Uh, and, you know, you can take your glasses off and refocus if all your, your vision problem is purely just uh, what they call sphere. Uh, if you have some astigmatism, you can't take that out no matter how carefully you focus. Um, but <laughs> Teleview, um, being who they are, they actually came out with a, a stigmatism correction that fits over their eyepieces. You just take the rubber eye cup off and this thing fits over and then you have to twirl it to get it to the right axis for your astigmatism. But it actually does work. I've got one that I bought a long time ago that uh, the problem is if I got to take it off if anybody else wants to look because it's it's it makes it worse for them for them. But uh, uh, it, there is such a thing. You have to know your prescription to when you order it. You know how strong your astigmatism is. So I have a question. Uh, I asked a few of the guys this last night, but I've got a eight inch top, eight inch Dobsonian, and it came with like a twenty eight millimeter. Okay, now I really I need to study up on the exit pupil. I don't really understand that, but if you guys had a, a go to size uh, eyepiece, and I do have the I've got two inch or inch and a quarter, either one. So what size would you get with an eight inch? It's it's twelve hundred millimeters, so. I mean, 28 is, you know, around, you know, less than 40, I guess, but or around the 40 mark. Which eyepiece would you guys get as far to see DSOs? That's about what I would do, David, somewhere in the mid-20s. Um, okay. Again, you just, just uh, I, don't, I can't do all the math on the tip of my fingers, but, you know, that'd be a very reasonable power, probably a very reasonable exit pupil. You know, uh, you know, tw 25 to 30 is going to be a, a real nice low power for you, somewhere in that okay. range. Okay. Yeah, I would use anything that will give you about 100 power is pretty good for DSOs. It, it, redu it darkens the field enough you can see them a little better. And uh, uh, you probably have to have another eyepiece that's lower power just to make sure you can find it. Right. But, so, but then, then you can switch up to your hundred power. Which, if you have a twelve hundred millimeter focal length, well, I guess that would be a twelve millimeter eyepiece. Would be about your ideal for for you know looking at faint fuzzies. Yeah, your two your two low power eyepieces. I, I agree with John. Uh, are eyepieces where the field of view is going to be important. Uh, and the lowest power can not be all that expensive, if, but of course you got to get, you're going to spend some money to get a wide field of view regardless, but it, it doesn't have to be a quality eyepiece is my point. You're just using it for finding and you need the big field of view to help you see more of the sky. Then you need a nice uh, eyepiece to observe with. And John, about a hundred power is about right for dark sky. And again, a wide field of view is nice. Just... Thanks because it gives you that perspective. Then after that, as you go up, maybe, you know, for other things like globulars and, and where, you know, and galaxies and, and planets where you don't, feel of view doesn't in that port. And, you know, it's not uh, all that advantageous to spend the money for one of those hand grenades or cannonballs. <laughs> that, no, I'll, uh, I'll disagree with you there, Bruce. I, yeah. I was going to say, I'll disagree with you, Bruce, because... One of the things I like to do is I have a uh, 42 millimeter Urfl, which is a really nice eyepiece. And with my telescope set up, it has a nice, for example, one of the most beautiful views in there is you fit both of the uh, uh, double cluster and Perseus in there. That's one of the most beautiful views. It's just, wow. And then it's for just scanning through the uh, Milky Way. It's beautiful and you it's flat pretty much out all the way to the edge. So. You know, it depends what you want. I mean, for me, that's a, that was a worthwhile expense because I like to do that. That is, a, I like that nice field of view and seeing those wide, you know, if you get the, uh, you know, what's so called the Lagoon Nebula and the Triffid in the same field, that's pretty too. Yeah, I can see that. Um, I, guess, I, I, guess I, I like the, the uh, I like the, you know, not the real wide field lab pieces, but like the 68 degree or 60, 60 degree, uh, which is like the Excels, I think that, uh, that Carl was talking about. 
and uh, th those are real reasonable. And especially for your like your 25 millimeter eyepiece that gives you uh, what would that give you on 1200 uh, for 48 power, 50 power. So um, and that there's a lot of things to I, I've used uh, about that power uh, for 30 years and uh, seen a lot of stuff. And, and then go to a and my um, like my. 12 millimeter or 10 millimeter eyepieces there. I like my plossels. I've even got a, I've got an 82 degree Nagler, but I'll use my plossels most of the time to look at stuff. Cause they're like light and, and just good eyepieces. I've got Teleview plossels down there, but they're not that expensive. That's the other thing, David, I guess it depends on if you mean, are you looking at DSO? Do you mean open cluster or do you mean nebula or you mean globular? Because some of that will, will depend. I guess for me, when I was talking about my question, the large field of view eyepiece, I'm like Michael Borelli. I'm looking for a really large open cluster and I want to see it all at once. So th that was my goal. But again, if you're doing other things, that may not be your goal. Well, really, it's just uh, I, I want to see it all. You know, I, I don't want to spend a fortune. I don't want to spend a fortune on it. And the twenty eight's okay. I mean, I, I I was able to see most of those uh, clusters last night. And Nebula, maybe not so much. Except, you know, something like Orion, I, I couldn't see much more. The I did see uh, one Michael showed me last night. I don't even remember which one that was actually. But, Lagoon. Uh, Lagoon. Okay. Okay. Good deal. Uh, but I would say. So I'm hearing that I should probably buy a 12 thereabouts to give me 100 power and put, if I'm going to buy a quality eyepiece, it probably needs to be in that range. I would think so. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then maybe get a, get a 40 or 42 just to find and like Michael was saying, just to be able to have a wider field of view there. Right, but if you want to go planetary, either get, make the decision to go with the 12 and the Barlow or do you get a six millimeter eyepiece? So you have to make your call. Right, well, right now I'll, I've got an eight by 24 zoom with a Barlow and I have no idea if the Barlow is quality or not. I would guess not because that's, it came with the scope. So, uh, you know, so I can get it down to, uh, you know, four to 12 with that zoom piece and it works pretty well. It's okay. I mean, it's not too bad, but it's not quality. It was only a, I don't know, $80 eyepiece, something like that. Yeah, a 40, well, that, millimeter, a, 40 millimeter might be a little much for, for your scope. I think you said it's 1,200. I yeah, think 30, I mean, 30 would be more like it. 30 okay. or 35, yeah. Yeah. Okay. You, you want about four and a half per inch power, three and a half to four. Well, and at your age, probably four. My <laughs> age, I could even use less. But, you know, it's, uh, it's as, as Carl says, you're, it's not that it's bad to have an exit pupil that's larger than your than your eye can take in. You're just wasting the light. Right. If you want the wide field of view, get the get you know get the lower power eyepiece, but you're you're losing the light. Like, you're losing. I'll have to study up on that. I don't understand that yeah. all that well. But well, the nice thing about having a zoom eyepiece, David, is you can try out all these different powers for free. And right. just kind of see which power you think is best. Because what we're saying is what we like, but you may not. So just dial in a certain power and see if you like it or not. If you don't, try, try a different power and see if you like that one. And then when you so, figure out which which zoom setting you use the most, buy that fixed focal length eyepiece. Okay. Um, out some night and then get people to loan you. There's a couple of their favorites. I got a little cheap SV Boney 40 millimeter, which that was about the lowest power thing I saw on the market and it was only about 35 or 40 dollars so that's a win okay folks seem to like that one okay. so something high powered something low powered you've got one in the middle so. right okay appreciate it all Got any more questions out there? What was the lowest magnification that the scope was good for? On one of your early slides, they were talking about highest for probably four x per inch. Four x per inch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more or less. And these mm -hmm. numbers are—I can either share you my slides. You, they're all online, and I, I think they're even the document I sent out. In fact, I know they are. So I'm happy to send that to you if you need it. Okay. 
Yeah, I can find that out. I just hadn't thought about lowest useful power. The uh, the four X comes from if you assume your your maximum uh, dilation is like a quarter of an inch or one fourth of an inch. So four X power is going to give you, uh, you know, you're just taking an in the number of inches and dividing by four, and that's going to be your exit pupil. So Anything larger than that, you know, if your eye can only accommodate a quarter inch, then that's where that four, four, four X per inch comes from. Okay. Um, pretty simple, actually. Maybe you get the optician to give you some uh, dilation chemicals. Yeah. <laughs> I dilator. I wondered about that too, yeah. Rook. I, I I recommend not doing that. <laughs> Just in one eye. <laughs> oh, See, at my age, I probably got a five millimeter X uh, <laughs> pupil at most. So I'm I, I, so a fifth of an inch. Hmm. So you'd use five X per power per uh -huh. inch then, right? <laughs> But I really don't worry about it. If I want a wide field of view, I put the eyepiece in there that'll give me that wide field of view. And I mean, I'm just using, I'm not, I'm using a smaller telescope than the one I have is what it amounts to, but that's all right. Yeah, well, it's, whatever works. It's not a um, bad, it's not bad. You're just not getting all the light that's coming out of your instrument. Have you ever uh, used your scope in the daytime and, and you get this weird, you know, vignetting effect when you look through your eyepiece? It, it's nothing to do with your scope. It's the fact that your eye is very undilated. It's constricted way down to a very small entrance pupil. And you can only see a small part of the light cone coming out of the eyepiece. Hmm. I have a quick question. Um, what kind of scopes does everybody have? <laughs> fire range <laughs> yeah or what's your favorite i guess or maybe I've and got a, go. i've got an 11 inch <laughs> casserine and a 16 inch dobsonian okay i keep mine simple i have a uh two six inch newtonian reflectors and an eight inch newtonian reflector they're simple and inexpensive that's awesome and the cast grains are small for the aperture, so people like those because they fit in a little suitcase they can carry around. They yep. don't like paying for them, but they like transporting them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Your best well, scope is the one you'll get out and use all the time. Something, there you go. Yeah, that's right. That's uh, the best very portable show. and easy to work with. Not that's you know that's me. Yeah, uh, I'd echo that. I've got that black dog Sony I showed in the video is 80, 85 pounds on that. I'm 6'4", 250, and I, uh, I carry it outside, but begrudgingly some nights. My little refractor is 15 pounds with the, with the OTA and the, and the tripod, and that, that, that lunt gets more use. Not more use, but it gets at least as much use, even though it's much smaller. But it's, just, it's just a lot of work to carry the dog out, and it's only 10-inch. David Bell's got the eight-inch uh, Dobsonian Newtonian, and uh, uh, I think that's everybody's. Uh, pretty much everybody, when somebody says, "What should I get as a telescope, first telescope?" That's a common suggestion. It's simple, and got plenty of aperture for the money, and a lot to be said for it. Right. Yeah. But one of the things I'll, I'll point out is when you get those Dobs and they have the alt azimuth mounts. You really got to learn how to, to star hop if you want to find some DSOs. Well, that's why I always like the Newtonian because you could use setting circles and find something. Yeah, but you got to get all that set up. Doesn't take that long. Yeah. <laughs> I bought a grab and go a couple of years ago, a 80 millimeter F5. Uh, I think it's a, I think it's made, but uh that's a nice little scope. You've got to put it on a decent, I've got a decent mount for it. Um, but uh, you can see most of the, most, most of the, uh, you can find most of the uh, Messier objects with it. 
and see you can get good views of the moon. It's real easy to, uh, real light on your budget and easy to take out. Something that's a good starter scope until you get better. Something else is to borrow, go, go, uh, uh, check out a library telescope at the library. Those we also have scopes. We also have four telescopes <clears throat> that we loan out to uh, club members. So you can always borrow one of those. Well, I had one. Um, <laughs> long story about that. But anyway, it was a uh, um, Orion Skyview Pro with an equatorial mount, eight inch aperture. Oh my goodness. So you went to right to the t uh, higher to the, end of things. I did. <laughs> and, um, and I loved it. It was just, of course, massive. Like who wants to move that? Nobody, not me. I don't, I want to get out there and be able to grab and go. Um, so I'm looking for something like that, something easily portable that's going to show me all the things that I want to see. I'm not sure what your budget is. I, I got a Vixen 80 millimeter refractor um, this spring on a on the uh, Porta 2 tall mount. Uh, that That's a really nice telescope. Again, it's under 20 pounds the entire setup. You know, 80 millimeters is a little bit small for, for DSOs, but, you know, for planets and uh, mm -hmm. for the moon and even for the sun, if you want to put a filter on it, it worked really well for that. Um, it's actually up for sale if you want it. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, if another common scope is a six inch F5 or F8 telescope on an equatorial mount. You can get a go to version of it anywhere between $600 and $800, or you get a simpler version closer to $500. Well, and, and if you're looking at portability and you're making trade-offs on aperture, uh, the equatorial mount comes with extra weight because you got to have counterweights and all that. Look at yep. Chris's, Tody's uh, 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 alt azimuth uh, scope behind him there. Uh, those, those are nice grab-and-go scopes in the six inch, five inch, or even eight inch range because you don't have all the counterweights and stuff. Yeah, the counterweights is what got me. It's out azimuth, but who cares? I mean, you know, if you're not doing imaging, uh, it works well, just fine. Again, some people find difficulty star hopping to find objects. Now, if you have an a Dobsonian go-to, that's a different story. Well, his is not a Dobsonian. It's a out azimuth uh, on a tripod there. It's a Schmidt Casagrin right. on a on a one out one arm uh alt azimuth mount it's got a computer and all that okay so say that's go to though right yeah, that's yeah nice and, that too. and it has a and it has a wedge yeah and there you, you go. do it with a wedge and there you got you got imaging so you got it all right there with no counterweights uh pretty yeah but you know i like to, to do the go uh, the uh star hopping i in fact i'm doing a program right now and i'm trying to decide if i want to continue it because the damn thing is so automated, uh, uh, you know, finding it is for me, finding the objects uh, physically is half, if maybe more than half the fun. It's the challenge, you know, tracking it down and learning the constellations and, and so forth and learning to judge the difference in the different magnitudes of stars so you can find your way around is uh, sort of the fun. And I, I don't know if I want to keep doing this, what I'm doing. It just slews over there and it, finds itself and there it is you know another thing is the is the the binocular programs you know the uh uh 50 messier objects and uh uh there's some other binoculars programs to to learn to use the binoculars before you try to use the scope then you learn the constellations now we've also got Ed giving a presentation tonight. We don't want to forget Ed. Oh, yes, yeah, yes, yes, we do. Yes, we do. Uh, well, that was five minutes before the end of the meeting, so I don't know. <laughs> Ed, would you like to step up? Yeah, do you have enough? Do you have enough time? Is everybody about to get off the call? I mean, no, no, no we'll wait. <laughs> no, we'll wait. I've been on here for about two hours, so it's all you good. Too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I can stay on a few more minutes, but I may have to bump off it. Sorry. All right. My uh, monitor keeps going off, so I don't even know. There it is. Um, I'm 
well. All right, if my monitor doesn't go blank again. Um, I've been to Stellafane in Vermont a couple of times in the past, and this year I was on the fence about whether I wanted to get on an airplane and go up there, but uh, I got a book that one of the members of that club wrote back in the 70s. Uh, it's usually pretty high priced. It's out of print, but it came up on Amazon as a used book for a reasonable price, and it's a biography of Russell W. Porter, who um, I'll talk about in just a second. And I read that, and I thought, well, I'm going to go. So I, I got my plane tickets and headed up there and, and went to uh, to Stellafane in Vermont. All right, is my slideshow up? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So this was in August of 2021 in Springfield, Vermont. It's a little bitty town, kind of in southern Vermont. And uh, it's been held there. This was the 85th time that it had been held. Yeah. Now, it started in 1926. And they skipped a few years when, uh, at the end of World War II and a couple other times. Uh, but for the most part, it's uh, been going on for close to 100 years now. So Russell W. Porter was a native of Springfield, Vermont. He, when he was young, he went on several Arctic exploration deals. Uh, was a member of a crew on, on several expeditions. And he did a lot of the surveys and things on those crews. So he, I guess, was self-taught as a surveyor and knew how to use optical instruments and was very precise in what he did. He studied as an architect. He was an artist and did all kinds of other, other stuff. He's a machinist as well. And you've seen his drawings. There's a drawing here of the 200 inch dome at Palomar that the uh, telescope is in uh, out there in California. He actually owned the site where Stellafane is today. So another important figure was James Hartness. He was a mechanical engineer and he ran the Jones and Lamson Machine Company in Springfield. Springfield is on a river that has enough fall to it that they could run a lot of machinery with water power and this company built different uh, machined type things and he came there and he had patented a turret lathe and that's him standing next to or operating a turret lathe that they manufactured in that plant and he had a lot of money because he got a royalty every time they sold one of those and these were sold for many many years out of that plant. He even was governor of Vermont for one term in the early 1920s. So Bruce talked about screw threads last month and the different types of screw threads that exist. And having just been up there in Vermont, I went to something called the American Precision Museum, which is in Windsor, Vermont, a little bit north of Springfield. That is where in an elementary school, when you learn about standardized parts being pioneered and manufactured in the United States, it started in that building that this machine is in and the company standardized gun parts. And that's how the United States Army was able to manufacture so many guns for the Civil War and, and everything else they've uh, manufactured guns for. This machine right here was the result of and the reason for uh, a lot of things I'm going to talk about. The re it's a result of a problem in standardizing screw threads. During World War I, manufacturers were having a hard time with different standards for screw threads and different qualities of screw threads. James Hartness represented the Mechanical Engineers Organization on something called the National Screw Thread Commission that was formed to standardize screw threads. He was on that commission and when he went 
after the war to apply some of the things that they had talked about on that commission, he recruited Russell Porter back to Springfield because he knew he liked to deal with optics to help him design this machine that you could put a machined part like something that was threaded on and optically magnify that part so that you could compare it to what you needed for your standard and you could use uh, measurement devices after you magnified it enough so that you could see it well enough to use those use those measurement devices. So this machine is the reason Russell Porter came back to Springfield, Vermont. Governor Harkness was an amateur astronomer and he built this wild looking thing on the grounds of his house. I took this picture in 2017. The house is was turned into an inn and now it's for sale. Uh, it has in the ground underneath it a tunnel that goes out to this telescope. So he could go out even if there was five feet of snow on the ground and observe because he could get inside of here from inside the house and stand in one spot and the telescope would rotate around the axis, the, the equatorial axis, and the eyepiece is in the center of that. So you just stand there in one spot and move the telescope around so that you can observe. And that's still there and that it's a big house on a bunch of acres and it's for sale right now if you wanna buy it. Underground there, there is a museum with a lot of the telescopes that this club that I'll tell you about built over the last hundred years. And the man who wrote the book that I bought that inspired me to go this year gives tours of that museum. This year he did not because of um, the hotel being closed down. So at the factory there in Springfield, uh, Russell Porter decided to form a club of employees of the Jones and Lamskin, Lamson factory to grind mirrors and build telescopes. And they got together in 1920 to do this. He got together about a couple of dozen people and sorry about the slides moving around. They conducted classes on the site of the plant and they would go out to this site that's in this photograph that shows Porter's land outside of Springfield where uh, he owned a few acres his family had and they would go out and camp and look at the sky with the telescopes they made. And this is where they built the famous pink clubhouse that I'll also talk about a little bit. It's still there, but it's a beautiful place. It's it's dark too, it's remarkably dark. Uh, it's not that populated in that part of the world, but you would expect more light pollution. So they built the pink clubhouse in the early 20s. Porter designed it and the club built it. And it sits on this rocky point here that at the top of this hill. Porter built all kinds of neat stuff into the clubhouse itself. On the back side, uh, on the south side, there's a uh, sundial. There are also a couple of different telescopes. They're, they're kind of defunct now, but he would have mirrors that were outside the building that would direct light into the clubhouse. And you could observe from inside of it. So they're always messing around with things like that. And this is where the club has a lot of photographs and sketches that Porter drew he did caricatures of people who visited and people who remembers the club, and those are all still in that building. In 1930, the club built this telescope, which is called the Porter Turret Telescope. The word turret appears several times. Uh, James Harkness invented the turret, his turret lathe, and patented it. Then he built a turret telescope mount in his yard. Then Porter built this turret telescope, and it is a big equatorial machine. It points at the North Star in the center of that little dome-like area. And then the arm you see has a mirror at the end of it that is used to direct the light into 
the middle of the of that building and you observe from a point on the inside there that does not move. Uh, and they've tried to modernize this over the years. I'm not so sure it really works. They're always messing with it when I've been at Stella Fane because these things, it's a, that one's 91 years old. So, so it takes a lot of, lot of effort among all these amateur astronomers who like to tinker and build stuff. All right, still having trouble with my monitor turning off. Okay, so they built that in 1930, and 1926, they started having gatherings at the site every year, and people would come and visit and enjoy looking at all the things they built and also just having a good time looking at the stars as well. Still having trouble with my monitor, so. Ah, crapping out on me. Um, maybe we can see fine, but maybe you can't. You're yeah, I don't know maybe. what slide you're on, though. Okay. See, that's my problem. Go back. Go back. Go back. Go back. Go back. Print telescopes. Uh, that's about where you left off. Swap tables. Okay. Uh, now I've got it back up. So in 1926, they started having the, the club meetings, and those were on the site that's marked Stellafane in the upper left. And it's maybe three acres up there. And they would camp in pastures around there, but then over the years, people planted trees on those pastures. And a few years, you know, went by and they bought about 40 acres over there on the right hand side of the screen. And that's where they developed a really elaborate camp, essentially. Um, the machine works is gone. They don't, um, they don't have that big factory there anymore. So the members come from all over the Northeast in uh, Boston and other places like that. And a club out of Boston really kept the place going for years. Um, so they all come together and maintain this 40 plus acre site. It's a, it's a whole lot to, to maintain. The uh, morning of the Saturday of the meeting, they have swap tables. So people come and bring all the junk they've accumulated a few, they're not supposed to be commercial vendors. But there's some really nice stuff. And if you're there in a car, you can buy more stuff than if you're flying on an airplane. So I'm always limited to little bitty things. They'd had a gully washer of a rain the week before. And this was really soggy out in this site. The whole place, all the dirt roads were, were really wet. But people get up at dawn and come out to that part. So the main thing that goes on is the telescope making competition. People bring in telescopes they've built. They've some have brought in old telescopes they've restored. There's um, stuff like the one on the right that's kind of assembled out of junk parts. There's some really good woodworking. And then there'll be people who are fantastic machinists who build things out of metal. Uh, one guy has a telescope that's just, he has brought it all three of the years that I've gone. It's kind of work in progress. Of, it's fantastic metal work. There weren't that many entries this year because a lot of people decided not to, to come out, but yeah. it was still really nice to, to see. <laughs> so observing takes place mainly on this side at Stellafane East. That's a really steep hill that goes to the south. You can see a little domed observatory there. There's another observatory behind where I was standing when I took the picture. And this is just early on, but by dark, there's about twice this much set up out there and just hundreds of people milling around. You can hear them talking about what they're looking at and they'll show you different things through their telescopes. And it's a lot of fun to just be out there and 
and be able to see what you can. And it's as dark as it is RRO without any real appreciable sky glow around the edges. There's a prison somewhere near Springfield, but it doesn't cause a whole lot of whole lot of trouble when you uh, when you try to observe. All right, tell me what slide you see, because I don't. Saturday night awards and talks. Just changed the okay. Yeah. All right. So on the Saturday night, they have talks in this large kind of natural amphitheater. The screen you see over to the left is a projection screen. They project uh, the award winners on it and then slides from the presenters. The club members all wear light blue shirts and they're down near the screen set up. Few people camp up in this area. There's a food vendor up on the hill here. And uh, that was before the crowd really filled in, but it was, it wasn't a small crowd this year. It was, it was really good. And Stella Kafka or Kafka from uh, American Association of Variable Star Observers talked about Beetlejuice this year. It was, they usually get somebody who's pretty well known to to speak. Um, the Naglers give away a bunch of eyepieces during this presentation. You buy uh, tickets during the, the convention and then they have a drawing on Saturday night for several different sets of, of Nagler eyepieces. And it's probably Twenty or thirty thousand dollars worth of eyepieces they give away. They donate each year. Al Nagler was not there this year, but I think his son was at, at this one. All right, tell me what's on this slide. Next convention. <laughs> All right, so the next convention will be in July of next year, and uh, that's the pink on the pink clubhouse. There are a lot of different uh, theories about why it's pink, but. Uh, it's been that way for a hundred years and it's really, really neat deal. So I encourage you to go. Um, it's a nice camping trip with observing in a neat place. And it's not that difficult to get there. You just fly up to, I fly to the Hartford, Connecticut airport. Um, this morning I woke up near Gilbert, Arkansas and drove home. It took me two hours. When I go up to Stellafane, I land at Hartford. It takes about two hours to get from there to Stellafane, and I go through four different states. So uh, it's all compact up there in, in New England. If y'all have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Right, Trip. What did you bring home? What did I bring home? Yeah, you said you went to the swap light. Uh, yeah. Uh, I bought, um, had to be small. I got this little collimation tool thing and uh, it's called a light pipe. I bought it from Gary Hand, who, uh, even though you're not supposed to be a commercial vendor, and he is, he always has a bunch <laughs> of stuff. I got that and what else? Oh, just some other little doodad. It has to be small enough to go in my luggage on the plane. It's always fun for you to share that trip with us. I enjoy hearing it every year, sir. Thank you. All right. Well, if I go back next year, I'll take some more pictures. <laughs> Maybe somebody can take a trailer. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be a drive, wouldn't it? There's one guy. Three days. <laughs> There's a fellow, he's, pro he's probably about 18 or 19. His name is Zane Landers, and he's been in some of the astronomy magazines. He's a real enthusiastic young guy. He, he builds a lot of telescopes. He always buys a whole lot of stuff. You see him carrying around big telescopes. So I guess he, he, must, he lives in Connecticut, I think, and collects a bunch there. Got to take John with his binoculars up there. Yep, he could enter. I'm sure 
There's a I just can't fit them on the airplane. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Ed. Right. We sure appreciate it, sir. Yeah. Uh, and we're grateful every year when you when you give us this presentation. Um, does anybody? Did I miss anybody earlier uh, that's new to the group that hasn't introduced themselves that would like to at this point? All right. Uh, I, I do have a, a quick little reminder. I uh, just wanted to announce to everybody that uh, that uh, that the monthly programming is now included on the, the club calendar each month and uh, to be looking online for the moon event for the 16th, uh, which is this next weekend, uh, which it's got uh, Daryl be talking about the moons in general, including Jupiter and perhaps Saturn uh, real time images. Of these will be provided by Chris Lasley and Danny Flippo and from, from their RO observatories. And Rocky will be providing a tour of the moon. Uh, and uh, along with, like I said, we'll have uh, uh, live presentations from Danny and Chris's instruments that will all be streaming on, on this next weekend. And uh, y'all keep an eye out on that. Uh, we'll have it on YouTube, Facebook, and on Zoom. And uh, we just want to say thank you all for participating tonight. And if anybody else has got anything else. Just a question. Uh, hopefully it'll be clear next uh, weekend, but what if it's not? What is it, what's the alternative plan? Well, if uh, some of the other members were here, I'd probably say that it will end up just bumping it by a, a day or two or Maybe within uh, three days as an alternative. I thought about maybe just doing a PowerPoint with uh, you know of the objects we're, we were going to look at anyway, but uh, it'd be better to have it live for sure. Oh, it would be yes. We're, we're, we're shooting for live, and if it doesn't, then we may end up just having presentations. So, can we stream a scope from Texas or Oklahoma? We can we can stream anywhere that they can connect into us via Zoom. I mean, we could zoom into the other telescope maybe and get clear skies. Uh, that might happen. All right, um, and uh, don't forget that uh, there is a. Uh, If you want to be a, pre a presenter or if you want uh, to cover any topics in any month, please reach out to us. Uh, we'll be happy to get you signed up. And that way you can continue to help participate in the group itself. And um, on that, I think we're just going to close up for the night. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Clear skies. Night. Take care, everyone. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye.